All right, here we are back again, New Hope Bible College, a series on Job for spring of 2020. Last week we looked at Job, some of the th reasons why he did what he did, what he went through, some of the questions he asked. Today we'll look, continue with his perseverance, his uh, patience. The word patience in the Bible is endurance. Job got through the situation that he got through because he did trust God. Yes, he was frustrated. Most often in the book of Job, we find him in a state where he was just totally frustrated with what was going on. But he never quit. Uh, there was never a time when he denied God. There was a time when he felt like God had denied him or God wasn't listening to him. As we all tend to go through in our lives at times, David mentioned many times before, David, one of the Psalms that David wrote, uh, he said, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? Uh, that was his feelings. By the end of that psalm, though, he was praising God because he knew that God did not really forsake him. That was just his feelings. And with Job, the same thing is going on. Job is frustrated. Uh, last week we looked at uh, chapter 29, how Job wanted restored back to his health and his wealth. Uh, his, not so that he would have the money that was not... The issue it was it said Job was wanting to make a difference in the town that he lived in. He wanted people to listen to him once again. He wanted people to know uh, to know God as as he knew God. And so, very nobly, uh, Job asked for restoration, not selfishly or pridefully, but out of honor to God and honor to the ministry. He wanted God to restore back the things to him. This week we'll look at. His innocence, his crying out for innocence. And some of the things that we'll look here is that what Job goes through in his own heart, he examines himself. Uh, the Bible tells us, let a man examine himself. And so Job did that, he examined his own life to try to figure out is there sin that caused the situation that I'm in? Uh, remember, we've talked about that many times in the past that just because you're going through a tough time, physically or financially, uh, with your health or socially, or whatever it might be, you're going through a tough time, it does not mean that God is chastening you, necessarily. But we do have to realize that there could be times when God does chasten us because of our sin. And that's why we need to be totally honest with ourselves, examine our hearts, and then after we examine our hearts, if we don't find fault, then we pray and ask God to judge us. Uh, as a psalmist many times asked God to judge them. We need to ask God to judge us and reveal to us any hidden sin that we have. Because sometimes we are easily blind to our own sin. Now, again, that doesn't mean all chastening is due to sin. But that's a good place to start in your life. If you're going through a tough time right now, a very good place to start is in your own life, examine yourself, then asking God to examine you. If after a time of... of inner uh, search at the time of letting God search you and you cannot come with it up with a right, logical reason why you can't realize any sin that you committed then you go to that next step and that is asking God to teach you something in the storm that you're in uh, whatever trial that might be you know real Christians go through trials uh, when there was famine in the land Christians suffered just as well as non-Christians the, Matthew says the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. So uh, ask God why you, you know, what can I learn through this trial that I'm in? What can I learn because of what the situation my finances are in? Or whatever it might be we go through. And then after that, you cannot come up with some reason why. Uh, you, or maybe you've learned your lesson, but you're still going through it. Then you go to the third step and ask God, Okay, Lord, through this, let me use this situation in my life that I'm going through to minister to other people. And I find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, when Paul talked about the comfort that we're comforted with when we go through a trial. What God comforts us, then we use that comfort in our lives to go out and comfort others in their lives. So a lot of good reasons why we go through trials. We know why Job went through his trial. Remember Job chapter 1, chapter 2. God tells us exactly why he went through it. It's because God was testing him and showing him off to the world. Uh, and so Job here 
does examine himself, and he calls for God to answer. He, he wants God to reveal to him what's going on here. And so Job says in chapter 31, he said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above, and what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Does not he see my ways and count all my steps? Here, his commitment here, he said, I may cover my, my eyes that I should not think upon a maid. In other words, Job here says, I'm not going to lust after other women. Uh, is that the sin? That, is that why I'm going through what I'm going through? No, the answer would be no to him. He said, I, I made a promise to God, and I've kept that promise to God that I wouldn't lust after others. And so, uh, after this examination, then he goes and says that he had not lied or deceived in chapter 31, 5 through 8. He said, If I have walked with vanity, or if my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance. Remember the, the justice, the blind justice with the scales here. It's the figure, uh, the imagery we have here is let, my, uh, let me be weighed in an even balance, judging God's word against us. If my step had turned out of the way, and mine heart walked after mine eyes, if any blot hath cleaved to mine hands, then let me sow, and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. So, Lord, if this is the thing, if I've deceived, if I've walked in vanity, if, if something, then Lord, reveal that to me, and lo, let others be victorious over me in this. Let others receive the good, and let me receive nothing. If that's the case, Lord. So, honest examination here in Job's life. He, in chapter 31, 9 through 12, he said, if my heart had been deceived by a woman, if I have laid weight at my neighbor's door, let, then let my wife grind into another, and let others bow down into her, upon her. For this is an heinous crime, yea, it is iniquity be punished by the judges. For it is a fire that consumes destruction, and would root out all mine increase. He said, if I had committed adultery, Lord, then, then I deserve to, to be punished from that. Of course, scripturally, if man and woman caught in adultery, they would be stoned to death. And so Job took this very seriously here. We don't have that. He didn't have the written word of God at this point. The book of Genesis had not been written. But he did know that this was wrong. And he knew that socially, that that was not just unacceptable, but socially it was a crime as well uh, to commit adultery. So again, he's, he's truly seeking out himself. Job had not failed to help his servants. Uh, he said, if I did despise the cause of my manservant, or my maidservant, when they contended with me, what then shall I do when God rises up and when he visits? What shall I answer him? Do not he that made me in the womb make him, and do not one fashion us in the womb. Here, Job is looking at the relationship he had with the, the servants in his house, his employees, and said, Lord, have I mistreated any of them in any way whatsoever? Because he goes back and he even says, in verse 15, did not he that made me in the womb make him? I'm no better than my, my employees are. I'm no better than my servants are. You know, Christian business people need to really think about that. You know, think about that, how they treat their employees because God holds them accountable for that. How we treat one another, God holds all of us accountable. But how an employee treats his uh, uh, employer and treats his employees, that we have to be concerned about that as well as employees, how they show respect to their employer. So Job here is, is telling the, his case here, Lord, if I've done them wrong, then let me know. Then he says, Job had not failed to help, help the poor and needy. And we have evidence of that. Remember back in 29, chapter 29, Job goes through and he talks about you know, that he was able to help others, help the widows, help the orphans. Uh, he was able to make a difference to those. In chapter 31, he continues, said, if I've withheld the poor from their desire... He said, or caused the eyes of the widow to fail. If I had something that I was able to help others with, and I did not do that, then Lord, judge me. You know, sin is not just committing acts. Sometimes it's omitting acts. Now, sins of commission or sins of omission. Uh, sins of commission is when we uh, grieve, uh, or, uh, grieve the Spirit. When we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And when we leave something out, we quench the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, telling you to give to a certain uh, situation, 
and you refuse to do that, then you're quenching the Spirit, you're omitting something in your life. Maybe it's witnessing. That God wants you to witness somebody, and you're not doing that. So you're quenching the Spirit. You're, you're saying no to the Holy Spirit of God. And so Job here uh, says, you know, if I've done this wrong, or cause widows to fail, or I've eaten my morsel myself alone, if I have all my food and I eat that and I don't share with other people, Lord, let me know these things as well. Uh, from, from my youth, it was brought up with me, with a father, have I guided her from my mother's womb? I have seen, if I have seen any perish for want of clothing, Lord, there's people out there who, who have a need, and I have the means to fill that need, then Lord, show me that. Now, this is something we don't really ask ourselves a lot today in, our, in the church. Uh, we may give to a certain fund, uh, a food bank, or what have you, and we think that frees up as our responsibilities. But, you know, we have to give to those that we interact with, not just give to someone who will give to someone. And the days and times we live in with the coronavirus and all that's going on with the food supply, uh, that a lot of people don't have the food right now. Uh, a lot of the uh, poor that who get food uh, from the schools are struggling to get that. And so there's a lot of campaigns going on in this country to uh, give to food banks and food situations. And that's great. And that's right. And that's a responsible thing for us to do. But what about the people we actually see? Are we making a difference to those or are we just blindly giving and that soothes our conscience and we don't think much about it after that? Then we go spend our money that God has allowed us to have on the wrong things. And I'm not saying it's, you shouldn't have nice things. I, I think that God allows that in our life. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But there are times when we do need to think about giving to others. And that's what Job here is doing. Uh, uh, if I had lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate, let, let my arm fall from my shoulder blade. My arm be broken from the bone. There's some serious statements here to God. Because Job here is talking to God. He's not talking to another person and just making a, a flippant statement. He's talking to God and saying, Lord, if I've done these things, then I really want to know. I mean, break my arms of it. That's what it takes. Uh, if I don't give like I'm supposed to give. So very importantly here, Job. And then... Job states very importantly that he had not, has not been trusting his wealth. You know, again, Job 29. Job asked for the, the wealth back, but he asked for it back for the right reasons, not just so that he, can, he, he thinks that the wealth is, is the answer. That's not what he's looking at. The wealth is not the answer. The wealth is a means to form the ministry, perform the ministry that he wanted to, to perform here. So very, very uh, noble here of him. He said, if I made gold my hope, are you trusting your bank account? Are you trusting your paycheck? We're living in days and times. Some of you are struggling right now financially because you don't have that paycheck anymore. Uh, you don't have the means that you used to have. And so you are going through a very good trial before God because God will take care of you if you keep your eyes upon Him. Now, does that mean you won't suffer need yet? You, you may suffer need. We all do. Paul said, Philippians chapter 4, I quote that so many times when Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And he says, I know how to be full, I know how to be hungry, I know how to be down, abased, I know how to abound, to be up. And all things, he said, I've learned what state I am, that, that I can be happy, I can be content, because I'm trusting God, I'm not trusting my circumstances. And if you're looking at your circumstances to bring you contentment, it's not going to happen. You know, David thought uh, Bathsheba would make him happy. And it didn't last very long at all. And it would have haunted him for the rest of his life. He said, I rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gotten much. You know, taking pride in that oh, I've got all this and I've made all this money. And all. But it, there's nothing great about that. I know people want money and we all want it. I get that. But the fact is, those who have a lot, do I respect them just because they have a lot of money? No. And in fact, there's a lot of people I know who have money I have no respect for them because that is their trust. That is what they're looking to. When tr troubles come, if the money's not there, then they run away. Well, if you're trusting God, if you have a bank account or you don't have a bank account, God is going to take care of you and God promised that. I don't promise it. God promises it. He said he would never leave us, he would never forsake us, that 
David said in Psalm 37, 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor have seen begging bread. He said, those who trust God, God is going to take care of. Job had not turned to idolatry. You know, sometimes people get into trouble and they look to other things for help other than God. They've been in church for years and then the bottom falls out they have nothing. And so they look to other people for the solutions. They look to a job that gets them away from God. A job that takes them out of church thinking that that's going to supply their need. Well, they're turning to idols. They're, they're turning to trusting something other than God. And Job here tells God, you know, I didn't do that. He said, if I beheld the sun... When it shined, which sun worship was a, a, a typical pagan practice in those days, uh, or the moon walking in brightness, you know, those who trust their horoscope rather than trusting God, uh, looking to what uh, uh, astrological sign they were born under, thinking that that makes them who they are. And it's just ridiculous to think that. And yet so many people do. They looked at it. It's idolatry. We're to trust God. He said... And my heart hath been secretly enticed, my mouth has kissed my hand. This also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. If I have done these things, I should be punished for it. So Job here, again, being very, very honest with himself at all these points. And chapter 31, 29, 30, Job looked at how he treated his enemies, those who had been opposing him. Well, that's a difficult one for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to forgive I've heard people make statements. I've heard a preacher uh, one time make a statement from the pulpit that there's some things that he could just never forgive. That's dangerous. I mean, the scriptures are very clear that we are to forgive. Uh, Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one toward another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So how important it is to forgive? Well, that... Our relationship with God stands on forgiveness. And how important it is because when we forgive, that benefits ourselves. Not just the other person, but it benefits yourself. It benefits your relationship with God. And so Job here treated his enemies correct. He said, I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me. And if something bad happened to somebody who opposed me, did I get? was I glad over that? No. I, I know we're in a society today where we think that we're supposed to uh, uh, get even with people over the time something happens or we're to get back at them or even to get ahead of them whatever it might be and God here says no we're not to do that Job said uh, I didn't rejoice at destruction and hated me or lifted myself and evil found him neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul these are things that we must think about those who mistreat us how do we treat them do we forgive? Do we walk away? For some people, that's very, very difficult to do. But it doesn't matter whether it's difficult. It's always the right thing to do. And if you don't do it, you're sinning against God. You're sinning against God. You're harboring sin in your life. Psalm 66 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. So how important is it to get this sin out? Oh, it's of the utmost importance. Uh, Job here realized that. Job here also in his giving, and we see that many times in, in other passages, but here again, he said, If the men of my tabernacle said not, Oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveler. So Job said, I opened up my home to people who had a need. I, I gave of what God had given to me. And Job had not hidden his sins. He said, if I covered my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, remember Adam and Eve, when God came down the garden, they hid themselves? And so the psalm, or Job here says, if I did that, hiding the iniquity, did I fear a great multitude or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out of the door? So Job here is honest with himself. And he's honest with that, realizing that you know, hidden sin is still sin. And if we don't want to admit it, it's still sin. Whether we recognize it or don't recognize it, it's still sin. And so Job realized that and points that. And he wishes that God would hear him. He said, oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is 
that the Almighty would answer me, and that my adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto him the number of my steps, as the prince would uh, go near unto him. Uh, I understand this. I think you do too. Times when you cry out to God for whatever need it might be, and you don't get a response or not. You Maybe you do get a response, but it's not the one that you want. And so you keep looking for a different response. Uh, and sometimes God doesn't tell us. And sometimes God leaves us in the dark. Why? He's God. He can do whatsoever He chooses. Sometimes He does reveal things to us. But sometimes they're not revealed because we, we're blinded to them. We want something different than what God has intended. And Job here recognizes the fact that you know, I, I want God to answer me on this. He says, I'm, I'm really struggling at this point. Job had not been unfair to his workers. Again, goes back to the, uh, we talked already about this before with the employee employer relationship. But he says, If my land cry against me, or that the furs likewise there of complaint. If I had eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, let thistle grow instead of wheat, and cockle instead of barley, the words of Job are ended here. So, if I've taken things that don't belong to me, you know, if I've eaten the fruits thereof without money, if I should have paid for it and I didn't, then these are sins in, in lives that sometimes we don't recognize as sin. Job's closing monologue here was in chapter 29, 31 that we looked at. You know, we have Elijah's speeches in 32 through 37, uh, several chapters uh, on nothing when it comes down to it. Uh, two speeches by God in chapter 38, most important speeches. Job's response in 42. And his restoration in chapter 42, 9. Uh, Job responds to God. He acknowledges the power of God. And so important for us to do is to recognize that God is in control. Whether we feel it or don't feel it, it doesn't make any difference. Just get past that if you can. And realize that God is in control. He is all-powerful, omnipotent God. Job humbles himself before God, realizing that no matter what, when I come through this, Lord, you're still great, and I'm still in and of myself nothing. He acknowledges, though he now sees God. See, the things that Job went through, it did teach him something. He did learn a lot from that. He didn't always understand, but when it came through it, he humbled himself before God, and he realizes his errors, and he repents, because his errors in what he, how he handled the situation. Uh, remember, he's not without sin. Right? When he questions God, that's, that's wrong. Uh, and so Job realizes that, that I didn't handle everything like I should have handled it during this trial. So Lord, I do repent over that. I, I do realize that I was wrong in, in these things. And then God rebukes Job's friends in chapter 42, verse 7. I mean, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu, these four good friends of, of Job, and I have no reason to doubt their, their friendship, but we do have reason to doubt their message because their messages are wrong, just flat out wrong. If we didn't have chapter 1 and chapter 2, we might be a little bit confused about some things that Eliphaz said. When Eliphaz said God came to him in a vision in the night, we'd be wondering, okay, did God do that? If God did that, then that doesn't make sense. Well, we have chapter 1, we have chapter 2, we know Job was righteous in what he was doing. We know Eliphaz just blatantly lied about that, trying to convince Job to overcome his so-called sin. Bildad, Zophar, uh, Zophar didn't speak as much as the other ones, but still, uh, he was wrong in what he did. The best thing he should have done is kept his mouth shut, just as Eliphaz, Bildad, and Elihu should have as well. God's wrath here for their folly your sin. You know, when you presume to speak for God and God has not spoken about it, that is sin. And a very dangerous sin. Because you're telling people, thus saith the Lord, when God did not say it. So be very, very careful about you handle people's situations. Be very careful about you thinking you know what's going on in the situation. I've often said, you know, if you're counseling two people, a married couple or what have you, you're counseling two people, 
uh, for whatever reason, there's usually three different sides to the story. There's his side, there's her side, and there's the truth. And so you've got to make sure that, that you seek the truth and don't just go by your friendship or your family member or what have you, but to go with what the truth of the Word of God is. So important here. Job said, or it says in Job 42, 8, Therefore take it you now seven bullets, so here's the sacrifice here, and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So, Elphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu here, God lets them know full well that you were wrong, Job was right. I'm going to listen to Job, I'm not going to listen to you until you do what I tell you to do. And so they took the sacrifice to Job, Job offered up, and Job prayed for them, and God then released the situation here. What a, what a great ending to this book here. They lied. They argued suffering is always uh, sent by God due to sin. That's not always true. There's some people who are in sin, we don't see any suffering. Some people continue in sin their whole life, and we don't even ever know whether they're suffering or not. They may be extremely wealthy. And so, you know, we can't, we're not good judges of that because we don't know the heart. Friends are restored. God instructs them to offer seven bullocks, as I said here, and seven rams. Uh, same, same verses there. Uh, after praying for his friends, the Lord restored twice as much as Job had lost. So, God did bless him financially, but it wasn't about the wealth. You know, if, I, if Job wanted and needed the wealth restored back, I don't think God would restore it back like this. Job did not need that, but God gave it to him anyway. Why? Because he can trust God, uh, Job would, that he would handle the wealth in the right way. Uh, if Job had helped the poor in the past, now he can help them twice as much. Help the widows or the orphans in the past, now he can help them twice as much. He's beautiful. Comforted by family, family and friends return to Job. He does have other children, and uh, he gains more children after that. He, the servants come back, his family member, his wife comes back. Hopefully, you know, she had been repentant of her sin when she told him to curse God and die. And blessed by God. And that's the thing about it, is that I have blessed by God here in chapter 42, uh, 12 through 17, and that's on, absolutely true. But the blessings began in chapter 1, verse 1 and continues throughout the whole book. Even in the midst of the trials, God still was blessing Job, gave Job the, the vision, the courage, the ability to go through what he went through. Job's no latter days blessed more than the beginning. In, we're talking about financially here, uh, increase. Lived 140 years, he saw the descendants to the fourth generation and died full of days. Uh, blessed with seven sons and three daughters. And gave inheritance to the sons and daughters. So Job was able to recover uh, financially. And more importantly, his testimony was such throughout the, his known location, wherever he, he lived at, uh, and was able to minister to people. And God trusted him to accomplish these tasks. So if you're going through a trial right now, there's a chapter 42 for you. you know, whatever it might be. You, you may not get what you want out of the situation. You may not get healing, uh, physical healing. You may not get financial uh, gain. But God will bless you. And God does hear us. And God does answer prayer. But we've got to do our part. All right. Thank you so much. This ends uh, the book of Job for us this semester. Of course, chapter 42. There are no more. I hope this has been a blessing to you. It, it always is a blessing to me to go through the book of Job. Uh, it helps me in my own life, my own situations I'm going through, and I'm sure it helps you as well. Thank you.